Good afternoon folks, welcome back to Higher Chemistry. We spent the last lesson and a bit having a look at esters and we explained what they were uh, made from, we explained their properties and we explained some of their uses. We looked at the fact that they're made from, and if you want to pause and test yourself, you should be able to tell me that they're made from an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. We looked at their uses. And we looked at things like uh, fruit flavours, fruit smells, uh, and we also looked at solubility. We looked at what they're very good at solvents for dissolving things like nail varnish or cleaners. Now, I'm just about to have come along and tell you that every fat, like bacon rind, and every oil, like olive oil, for example, are also examples of esters. Now, that might seem contradictory, but hopefully things will become clear. By the way, if you're interested, this is the SQA documentation, course spec, sorry, SQA course spec, uh, learning outcomes, and these are the pages in the Scholar PDF, if you have access to that. Um, for starters, I think we'll start with why uh, we require to eat them. They are essential for your good health because they often contain uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Can I remind you that esters are relatively non-polar and quite a few vitamins that we require for health uh, are also non-polar. And D and E, I think, if I remember correctly, tend to be the non-polar ones. Now that means they can't do the same trick that vitamin C can do. Vitamin C is nice and polar, so it dissolves quite happily in water and the last time you have a piece of fruit, you're eating some. Vitamins D and E, uh, though, need to dissolve in non-polar things and they are contained in fats and oils. Uh, so they contain fat-soluble vitamins. Keep you nice and healthy, believe it or not. Another reason that uh, fats and oils are really handy in our diet is they are incredibly dense energy sources. If I remember, I'll go and look up the number of kilojoules per gram of a variety of different energy sources and I'll pop it in the doobly-doo, the description of the video down below. Um, so they're an easy source of kilojoules for human beings. So that's the biological components to it. Let's have a quick look at what on earth is the structure of a typical fat or oil and why is it so different to nice fruit sweetie smells. Okay, on the left here we have the structure of a typical fat and on the right we have the structure perhaps of a typical oil. And no, the cellular fool hasn't lost what few remaining marbles I, I still have. I haven't drawn the same structure twice. There is a surprisingly subtle difference between these two structures, which is the number of hydrogens in this chain. These, these have C17H31s, these have C17H35s. And that pretty much is the only difference between, say, a block of butter and a bottle of olive oil. Why on earth would just missing a few hydrogens make such a big difference, an apparent difference to them? We'll have a look at that in the very near future. First of all, let's take a quick analysis rundown of what we're seeing here. Um, we are seeing molecules, which have got three ester links per molecule. So these are sometimes called triesters. Or, um, so there's your ester link three times over. Now, and the same thing here, of course. So if we were to reverse engineer these fats and oils, if we were to split them apart into what they were originally created from, like I showed you in the previous video, and Esther's go back and have a wee look if you're not sure, what we would do is we would break that bond there, that bond there, that bond there, and we'd recreate the alcohol. Now, it's an unusual alcohol this time because I'm hoping you can see it's going to have three hydroxyl groups. It's propan 1, 2, 3, triol. In fact, is its proper name. I'll draw it in a separate sheet of paper, don't worry, just to clarify. And we are also going to make three uh, carboxylic acid molecules. So, fats and oils are quite different to the previous esters we looked at. In that a single molecule of fat is made from one triol, triple alcohol, and three separate carboxylic acid molecules. Um, and so is the oil. Of course, it's exactly the same procedure here. If you split these bonds, you're going to get this molecule here, propan one, two, three triol, and you're going, oops, you're going to get three separate carboxylic acid molecules. Let's do that on the next page. So there's my fat molecule. Let's break these bonds there, and we will end up making. By the way, if we want to do this properly, we should actually add water, of course, 
in this case, three waters, because we're breaking three different esters within the single molecule. And I'm hoping you can tell me from your memory what the name of this type of reaction is. Feel free to pause, test yourself, and see if you can come up with the answer, which is... So we're going to hydrolyze this fat, and we're going to end up making... I'm probably going to rotate this around just for ease of writing it, folks. One, two, three. Also, just get used to remembering that you can, in fact, rotate molecules any way you like on the page. It may, by the, by the way, if you're, if you're not familiar with me, it may look like some of my work is a bit on the scruffy side, but if you have a look here, and I'm going to point this out to you because this would lose your marks in the exam, um, I'm actually surprisingly deliberate with how I draw these molecules. Despite being lazy enough not to put these H's in, you can't afford to do that, by the way. You don't have a degree in chemistry yet. It says that in the bottom of my, my degree. It means does not have to write hydrogens in when he doesn't want to. But look where I've done the bonds. That might not be true about the degree, by the way. Um, look what I've done this bond is between the carbon and the oxygen. It's not somewhere in the middle, and it's definitely not towards the H. That will cost you marks. So this is our alcohol molecule. Uh, and I did say earlier on, it's called a propan. Uh, oh, sorry, some people call it propan, propan. Propan 1, 2, 3, try all. It's got a more common name which trips off the tongue, and I'll bet you've heard of it, begins with a G. If you want to pause the video, feel free. Again, test yourself. You heard of an alcohol, and it begins with G, ends in all. It's actually a glycerol, which occurs all over the place. Um, it's in shampoo to make it gloopier. It's in gummy bears to make them chewy. Um, it's in some forms of antifreeze inside car engines because it lowers the freezing point of the water. So glycerol, um, propan 1, 2, 3 trial, that's the alcohol that's behind every single edible fat and oil. It's all the same, interesting, never varies. Let's have a look at the carboxylic acid molecules that we've made. And we'll do a balanced equation, of course, because we're actually making three of them. So we take this, break the bond there, we've put an H back on that O, so we'll put an OH back on here, and we'll keep the format. As you can probably imagine, I can't be bothered writing out 17 carbons in a row. But if you actually wanted to picture it, and you're going to have to because it's going to be useful for the next page, then you could picture it like this. You get the point. One, two, three, four, five, six. You get the point here. An even better way of drawing this is actually just... This is advanced higher sneak peek, by the way. It's called skeletal structures. We don't actually bother putting the C's in as letters, we put them as little angle changes in the lines. So if you ever see this sort of representation, then that is meant to be a big long chain of carbons. And there's a carbon at each angle change. That's what that means, folks. Uh, and of course you'd have a carbon with a double bond O, and a hydroxyl there as well. So that's your carboxylate group. Um, and here's the rest of the chain. As you can imagine, by the way, look at this big chain of C's and H's, nothing else. That is why fats and oils are very non-polar. Even more so than standard esters. Um, let's come back to this in a second though, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So, we have hydrolyzed a fat and we have made one molecule of alcohol. And we've made three molecules of these. These things are called fatty acids. Which sounds a bit unkind, but it's because they are carboxylic acids which have come from a fat or an oil. Um, once upon a time, you had to know the names and the structures of these. Don't worry, you don't they're taking that all out the, the higher course. Um, but you might want to pay attention here, though the crucial part is the number of H's. Because if we go back to the previous uh, page, we could see that apparently dropping the number of H's here from 35 to 31 is enough to change a fat into an oil. So does that mean that the only difference between fats and oils is the ratio of carbons to hydrogens? Pretty much yes. Uh, if you're bright, you might want to pause the video again and figure out where these missing hydrogens have gone. I wonder what the difference in the structure here is between a fat and an oil. And here's your answer. Um, when we have C17H35, that's 2N plus 1, you know, 
Two seventeen's thirty four plus one makes thirty five. Why is there not two n plus two? Because the other bond from the last carbon is to this carbon instead of to an H. But basically, what you can see, hopefully here, is that as you drop by two, every time you take away two hydrogens, we are introducing, of course, a double bond somewhere into this chain of carbons. Now this has a couple of effects, one of which is good for your health, and the other of which changes the melting point. Uh, I'm going to pause this and draw some stuff because uh, life is too short to watch me drawing big structures. So what I've got here, <clears throat> let's pay attention to the top, don't worry about the bottom there for a second. Let's pay attention to the top. What I've got here is two molecules of a fat. Now, uh, as we said before, this is a completely single bonded chain. Um, these are, of course, called saturated molecules. Is this ringing any bells? Saturated and unsaturated fats? So this is basically a saturated fat molecule. It's all single bonds. And as you can see, one molecule in pink here and the other molecule in purple can fit nice and perfectly into each other. This means that if you cast your minds back to what sticks one molecule to its neighbouring molecule, which hopefully, again, if you pause the video, have we think about it, you can tell me the answer is London dispersion forces, especially for non-polar molecules like this. So London dispersion forces exist between these molecular chains, big long chains of carbons, which are relatively nice and straight lines. Now, hopefully you can imagine... <clears throat> When the lines are nice and straight, the London dispersion forces can be relatively large because the molecules can pack nice and close to each other. They physically do that in space, by the way. They actually get nice and close, which means, remember, London dispersion forces are momentary imbalance of electron distribution. And it causes a dipole, it induces a dipole in the neighbouring molecule. The closer these two molecules can get, the stronger that dipole is. And oh look, saturated fats have nice strong LDFs. So therefore they have high melting points and they are solids at room temperature. Um, I remember as a kid you take some toast in the morning, take the butter out of the fridge, real just standard butter untampered with and then you try and scrape the butter out and then you put it on your toast and it just massacred the surface of the toast because it didn't want to melt. Butter out of the fridge was completely solid. This on the other hand now this is an exaggerated case, so any other chemistry teachers out there, don't throw fruit at me. I know I've exaggerated the angles here. It's for the purposes of this demonstration, uh, to quote Doc Brown. Now, um, this is an unsaturated molecule. You can see the double bonds creeping along. By the way, please note the double bonds don't have to be at the same places in all the chains. All these chains are not required to be identical to each other. We just usually do that for simplicity. So this is an unsaturated molecule. Um, because it contains double bonds. And as you can see, the chains are nowhere near as straight. Now, if I had the time and the technology, when I'm in the classroom, I usually do, but for now, if you imagine taking a second molecule like that and then trying to pack another one of these close to this, that's not going to happen. Okay, that is not going to happen because of the weird angles that are caused by the double bonds. Um, so as a result, uh, the packing between one molecule and its neighbour molecule is much worse, so they are poorly packed together. This results in lower, much lower in fact, LDFs, or weaker LDFs, sorry I do apologise, I'm trying to skip ahead. One thing at a time hey, results in weaker LDFs, which results of course, which you've probably figured out, as a much lower melting point. So this is effectively olive oil, and this guy here, this is lard or bacon rind. And as you can see, the consequence of having some double bonds is really interesting and fairly major in the real world. Here you end up with a lump of unspreadable stuff, here you end up with nice olive oil. Also, not as healthy, more healthy, for reasons that I'm not qualified to go into because I'm not a biochemist. Ask Dr. Borthwick instead. So going back to what I originally wanted to cover in this lesson, folks, I think we're all there, actually. I think we are all there. Um,
what am I going to do in the next lesson? The next lesson we're going to have a look at soaps and oils. Ironically, in a wonderful burst of irony, probably our second oldest chemical reaction is that fats and oils don't clean up. You probably know that if you ever tried to clean anything in the kitchen. Wait till you're a student uh, and you have your frying pan with baked on uh, bacon grease in it that nobody's cleaned for a couple of days and then it's your job to clean it. If you try using just water, you are on a hiding to nothing, of course, and that's all because of polarity. You can't clean non-polar substances with a polar substance. It's not going to happen. Or is it, of course? Because don't you just add a squish of soap and then suddenly the fat and the oil dissolves in the water? No, it's a lie. The cake is a lie and also fats and oils don't mix properly ever with water. We'll have a look at how soap pulls off this magic trick, this illusion, in the next video. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.